It's actually breaking into the pentatonic scale patterns. I like to think about it like that because there's so much more available than just two notes per string on inside of these little box shapes that we are so familiar with. So let's break into the boxes and find out what's in there because there's a lot of kind of cool shit hanging out inside of those boxes. <laughs> to uh, actually follow up on the lesson that I uh, talked about. It wasn't really a lesson. It was just kind of a exploration of an idea, this business about uh, scales and modes and theory and how, whether there's necessary or whether they aren't and um, what do we have to do about them. So I thought that what I would do today is talk about a, maybe a practical application of some of the more... Um, sophisticated ideas that might work over a blues. Um, and I'll use some theoretical language to describe it, but I'll also reinforce my original idea of that video, which is regardless of what kind of, of theoretical idea you might have, um, you have to create a melody or a sound based on what you believe in rather than just the, the formula. So, um, this is a big and deep and wide subject, but what I played in the opening segment there I think is an example of what you might consider to be a slightly more sophisticated approach to the blues than, say, a purely pentatonic-based approach. As cool as that is and as, as, as um, popular as that approach is, uh, there are other ways to think about a blues that... Um, I think include more of a harmonic perspective. Now, by harmonic perspective, I mean that it the melodies are based in chords that are being played rather than being based in a simple scale. And again, this isn't to try and say anybody who plays that way isn't hip or cool or good or bad or whatever. It's just, you know, it's an alternative way to think maybe to get some more of these sophisticated sounds under your fingers and into your ear. Okay, so I was in the key of A. Now, what I noticed is the A minor pentatonic, or even the A blues scale, I'll actually put something in there that shouldn't have been there. Um, it doesn't have the third of any of the chords that we're trying to apply it to, me meaning that there's no uh, C sharp in it for the A7, there's no F sharp in it for the D7, and there's no G sharp in it for the E7. And, you know, if we have a B7 in there, which is too dominant, there's there's no, uh, well, there is a, in the blue scale, there's a um, an E flat or D sharp. That That is something that we can, um, hang our hats on. Um, if we play a two chord, a minor chord, it's it's covered relatively well by much of the scale. So the, the, what we have here is we have a, a scale that is incomplete in, and in some ways that's what makes it safe. And we're also really used to hearing those sounds. So to hear a flat a third or a slightly bent flat a third, which is usually what it is, the blue third I call it, that doesn't disturb us very much, even though we're playing it over a chord that has that in it. Or, or maybe the, the accompaniment doesn't have any third at all. Right? And then we can get away with both. And of course, you can always get away with both. It's not really a matter of getting away with anything. But it turns out that the, the typical scale that everybody starts with doesn't contain the, the natural third of any of the dominant seventh chords that are being applied, uh, that is being applied to. So first thing we can do is rectify that a little bit. So, in, you know, you hear this thing called think outside of the box. Well, actually, it occurred to me that actually what's really going on here is we're thinking inside the box. Because if we have this, all those thirds are living right in this area anyway. It's not like it's a big stretch. So for instance, the A7, would love to have a C sharp in it from time to time. So it really 
really sounds nice to, uh, to address the third of the chord. <laughs> And then on the uh, the D seventh chord, so the four chord, we could address the third of that with this F sharp here. So it's it's there. You know, a lot of people will call it different things. They say, well, that's the sixth from A major pentatonic. I am not really a proponent of this whole confusing thing of saying, well, play A minor pentatonic on this chord, then switch to A minor or A major pentatonic and then blend them together. And, you know, because <laughs> the thing is, is, you know, when B.B. King plays this, uh, or say, well, he's playing major pentatonic there, but of course he's bending these notes into notes that are in the minor pentatonic or at actually are chord tones of a dominant seventh chord. And a lot of times that isn't taken into consideration because people don't really think of the note that you bend to so much as the note that you have your finger on. So generally speaking, if you think that way, that's fine. I think there's a lot of, of you know, historical precedents for thinking that way. But what I prefer to do is I, I prefer to think of the chord of the moment and then all of the possible melodic applications for uh, that would give you color on that chord. Um, and so it's really more about starting with an arpeggio and then enhancing that arpeggio with color than it is about a, a, a five note scale and switching back and forth between them and that kind of thing. Um, so when we play over A7, we're playing A7 um, oriented melodies. And when we play over a D7, we're playing D7 oriented melodies. However you want to describe those, it the problem is it's idiomatic music and it really isn't about scales and, and uh, their relationship to chords. It's really more about a, a kind of melodic vocabulary that is developed over time. And then we need to be able to apply those melodies to uh, harmony. So for instance, I would play the third on the A7, the third on the D7, And then on the E7, there's a really neat thing because we can play the third, but we can also play this sharp nine. That, that kind of sharp nine on the five chord sounds particularly good. We can play the, both of them actually. By the way, if you want to play a good turnaround, one of the easiest and sort of most sort of uh, foolproof ways of making something that sounds like a turnaround over the five, four, and one in a blues is to play chord tones on each of those chords and use some repetition. So I might play... So I played over the five chord, over the four, then the one. Now, I colored it because I don't want it to just be like an arpeggio of this and then an arpeggio of that. So you have to color it, you have to make melody, you have to put some juice on it like a good singer might do. And, and then these things can start coming alive. Typically, if you listen to the sort of prominent and famous turnarounds, a lot of them are using chord tones and repetition. And so I just think that it's a good idea to remember to do that. And of course, if you're going to do that, you have to know where those chord tones are under your fingers, and you have to know what they sound like so you can, you know, make something interesting out of them. And the repetition part is really handy because it sounds then like you're doing something on purpose, <laughs> right? So if you say... I didn't do that very elegantly, but it, you know, I played a line over E7, which could be described as flat three to three, five to six, flat seven, 
to five to six to five. And then I played something very similar. Over the four and then I moved back to the one and I, and I finished the idea. So in, in all those cases, I wasn't thinking about any pentatonic scales. I was thinking primarily about the chord of the moment and in this, in this colorful blues vocabulary, which can be described numerically in terms of how it relates to the chord. Uh, but to back up just a little bit, we, I was talking about how taking a minor pentatonic scale or even a blues scale and adding some things to it on an as chord per basis, uh, does that sound right? A per chord basis, <laughs> um, then we can get in closer to the chord. So adding a C sharp to the A7, adding a an F sharp to the D7, and then mixing the, the G sharp and the G natural over the E. Right? And then maybe there might be other chords involved and we would do similar things to that. I'm not suggesting that we abandon the blues vocabulary that we're all used to, because if we do that, then it's going to sound like, you know, it's not going to sound as bluesy. It might, it might fit the chords, but it won't sound like a blues a vernacular. So we keep our bent strings, we keep our slurred notes, we just add in some color that matches up with the chord. Now, in addition to the third, you can add six. B.B. King starts off uh, the solo to Sweet Little Angel. She says, right? It's a great thing. It sounds sometimes a little bit like what they might use in a Western swing vocabulary, certainly in a jazz vocabulary. The six is a wonderful uh, note to add, as is the ninth. So you can see I'm using music theory or music location to talk about these things, but then when I play them, I'm trying to make melodies. Rather than, you know, running arpeggios and those kinds of things. It can all be described theoretically um, in a certain way, which is good for communication. So for instance, if you're playing your, put your hand down in this A chord shape right here, right? Some people would call that the F shape, but I don't believe in that either. So it's, it's an A chord here at the fifth fret. We want to know where all the chord tones are, the one, the three, the five, the flat seven and the one, and the flat three and the three there. We also want to know where the nine and the six, there's nine, there's six, flat five, we want to know where those things are because those notes are part of our melodic uh, palette. They're part of the, the uh, melodic continuum of the blues. Sometimes more sophisticated, sometimes less sophisticated. That's all up to you. I like playing this way because it kind of reminds me of how my favorite horn players and piano players might play. I don't get a lot of of influence from guitar players for this particular approach, but um, it's just a sound that I like and I'm going for when I play. So if I've got a little melodic world of sound over every chord in here, and then I can see that when I change from one chord to the next, not everything changes, only a few things change, and I recognize where they are and I can emphasize certain notes. So for instance, one of the big ones is if I've got a, a, a musical palette that includes A7 arpeggio for an A7th chord, the 6 and the 9, the flat 3 and the 3, and then the flat 5 and the 5. 4 is okay too. When I go to the 4 chord, the main thing I'm going to change when I change from a7 to D7 is that any C sharps would become C's, C naturals. That's the big change. Everything else is already kind of in the world there. So if I've got this, then I'm going to go to the D chord. Uh, I'm going to emphasize that note instead of that note because I don't want to hear that on the four chord. I want to hear that on the four chord, right? Uh, 
so what we're dealing here is with here is rather than a, a couple of scales, I don't even think of this as a scale thing. It's a chord sound with color. Now, someone could say, oh, it's a mixolydian with a flatted fifth and a flatted third added. Or, I mean, you could call it a chromatic scale with some notes taken away. If you need to call it something, that's fine. But for me to call it um, something is not really useful. So I just think of it as the sound of A7 in a blues. And all of these notes have their own color. I recognize what they are. I can say, you know, if I'm playing an A7 and I want to go D, I want to play the six and I know where it is. I, wouldn't, I know where that stuff is, you know. And then there's these little ornaments that I like to use. That's something personal as well to try and make them sound like flowers and melodies, not just dry um, information, right? So let's say I'm going to take an A7 and I'm going to make it go to D7 like we would do in bar 5 in a blues or even in bar 2. Still on my A7. Now I'm going to go to the D7. Now I play that C natural and the F sharp. Now I'm scooping into my third. Flat seven. There's my five chord. That was four. four chord now. There's my one. Now what did I do there? I wanted to get to the D chord in an elegant way, so I used an E minor chord and an E flat nine chord to get to D. So I again, I, I enhanced the harmony so I could make a, a little path toward my destination. In this case, it's a chromatic bass movement from the fifth degree of A to the flatted fifth of A to the four chord. And I used E minor, E flat nine, and D nine to get there. I can explain that theoretically, but I don't think it's necessary because it just it's just a, a method for getting to where we're going. And it would also make this a little even more convoluted than it is today. Needless to say, what we're going to do is we're going to approach this D9 chord that is my four chord from two half steps above. I could do E9, E flat 9, and D9, or I can use E minor 7, because the E minor 7 is very similar to the A 7th chord, which is the bar harmony, really. Then once I've got this, then I can play melodic ideas that are influenced by those chord sounds. So I can say, I'll do it with chords so you can hear it. on top of those chords so you could hear how wonderful that gravity toward the four chord uh, sounds. Um, maybe I'll add a sharp four diminished. Now the trick about sharp four diminished is whatever you play on the four chord sounds good over sharp four diminished except change the root of the four chord up a half step to be the root of the diminished because the D7 and the D sharp diminished the same notes in them except for the D turns into a D sharp in all of the octaves. So that might be something like this. Right? If there's 
no D in your line, you don't have to change anything. If there's a D in your line, then you can change the D to D sharp and you'll have a diminished uh, seventh idea. Then maybe we'll come back to one. And then another very common, slightly sophisticated thing in a blues is to go to six dominant. And then six dominant leads us to two, either two minor or two dominant. And then I have a little trick that rather than thinking of each of those chords and its arpeggio or a scale that's supposed to be associated with that chord, I let the chords do the work and I like to keep the melodies kind of in the blues vernacular. So I might say... Or... Any of those kinds of ideas. People say, well, what scales are you playing over those chords? To be honest with you, I'm really just thinking of blues melodies that are sort of vernacular uh, melodies. From, from all the listening that I've done, uh, there's millions of variations. Uh, and I find that playing them above a chord helps to make them, uh, it helps me discover them, and also it helps me understand how they work with the, the harmony that they're uh, being applied to. Okay, so... I have a couple of courses on True Fire uh, that um, go into to some detail on this and have many examples. It's all written out. I also have a lot of PDFs on my website that are transcriptions of solos that are similar to this without so much explanation. But if you're not interested in the explanation, you can go right to the transcription and check that stuff out. Of course, listen, 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 listen to horn players and piano players and guitar players and also um, uh Really try and, you know, imagine these sounds uh, and then call them what you need to call them so you can repeat them in all keys and all areas of the instrument. Um, but that's a little kind of expose on how to break out of the pentatonic rut. It's actually breaking into the pentatonic scale patterns. I like to think about it like that because there's so much more available than just two notes per string on inside of these little box shapes that we are so familiar with. So let's break into the boxes and find out what's in there because there's a lot of kind of cool shit hanging out inside of those boxes. All right, man. Thank you. Please remember to subscribe. Uh, I really appreciate the support that I've been getting lately on this. Check out my website. And check out my True Fire uh, work because I think that there's great value uh, there. And um, I think the presentation is pretty good too. So thanks. Take care.